thank you for making this film, first of all. The second thing, yeah. <laughs> Start off by asking you this question. Um, in the film, we see sort of a, a combination of footage that was sort of in the in the yeah. non-violent battlefield. Yeah. On the one hand, on, on the other hand, there was footage shot um, in very private surroundings in the homes of the main characters. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about that, and also if you shot all the images on the battlefield. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is actually a great question. Uh, because I can uh, bring up here one of the cinematographers and a longtime Israeli activist who is currently in Amsterdam, Jonathan Massey. <laughs> and uh, this film was, you know, film is inherently always collaborative, but Budrus took that collaboration to a whole new level. And uh, I tend to be like a spokesperson that goes around and get a lot of credit and attention. Uh, but really, this film um, was made by uh, at least, I'd say, 20 people, like actively. You know, that without those 20 people, there's no way this film would have been possible. And of course, then there's all of the thank yous. And thank you for staying during all the thank yous. Because um, there's, there's a lot of people that, that we really wanted to acknowledge and how we made the film. And so the way, so I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, I'm, I'm part of an organization called Just Vision. And uh, Just Vision was created about seven years ago in order to uh, document uh, what, was, what you did not see on the mainstream media, which were civilians who are courageously and actively for you know, years now trying to end the conflict using nonviolent means. And um, whatever bias you think the media has, I think that an over, overarching bias in the Western and in the Arab world is a bias towards violence. And what you always see is either militarism uh, from Israeli side or you see militants in the Palestinian side. And that's all that the world sees. In the meantime, there are all these thousands of Palestinians and Israelis on the ground who are struggling and, and getting more strategic over time, uh, trying to, to think of creative ways that where the process of, of bringing an end to the conflict um, is also uh, creates the relationships between Palestinians and Israelis that will make it possible for any agreement that is signed in the future to be long-lasting and not just a ceasefire. Because leaders sign agreements, but people are actually the ones who live it on the ground. So all of this work is is really like you know putting down the roots for for a long time um, peace in the region. And um, just vision is basically dedicated to finding those stories and bringing it to the world. Uh, our last film in counterpoint. Uh, was focused on more human stories of people who had lost loved ones and started working together. And one of the questions that we often got in Q&As in Israel and in the United States was, uh, where's the Palestinian nonviolence movement? Where's the Palestinian Gandhi? If only Palestinians used nonviolence, there would be peace. And there was a very simple equation made that we knew on the ground was much more complicated. So we started thinking about doing a sort of overview of all of the different villages that are currently every week struggling on the ground doing similar things that Budrus is doing. And, and I realized that all of the, the, a lot of the inspiration for these people came from this village. And this village was invisible. Nobody knew what had happened there. And so I started a process of investigating to find out if it was possible to retell this entire story and, um, and in a way that really grabbed people, where you felt like you were going through it. And that's where the amazing, uh, courageous, and incredible activists like Jonathan Massey and Shai Polak um, came in incredibly generously. They had moved on to other struggles because they kept going. Um, and so they hadn't done uh, things with footage. Shai actually did an, an amazing film called Bilay and Habibti. And, um, and like them, there were um, um, uh, several French people, Americans, uh, Danes, like people who were there and had like some of them, you know, just like 10 minutes of footage or something. And we ended up collecting about 200 hours of footage. Um, including all of the interviews that we did. So then what we went back is we, we you know, got the, uh, the people to really speak to us because a lot of this footage for many of these demonstrations is available on YouTube and what's missing is kind of the context of the humanity of who are the people who participated on that. And we wanted to really get you to identify with every individual including the Israeli army which was facing um, you know, a nonviolent movement. They were told that they were getting in there uh, to uh, combat terrorism. Uh, and instead they found women, children, uh, and men waving flags and chanting. And I, we really wanted to talk, talk to them about how, how was that. So really give a, um, you know, 
a, a full perspective. And, uh, and, and we've been now touring for, for 10 months with this film. Wow. Thank you. I want to ask you one more question before we open up to questions from the audience. One thing that sort of stood out for me in the film, throughout the whole film, is that you sort of chose a few women to talk about their experiences. So first of all, we have Ayed's daughter, who so courageously stands before the bulldozers and jumps into the hole. And then we have Yasmin Levy, the female soldier, which you give quite some time to, to sort of recount the, the, the struggle from her perspective. And then there's you, the filmmaker, the also a woman. So I wondered if you could sort of um, tell us a little bit more about what you think that the role of these women could be, and if it's any different to the men's in the struggle, and also your role as a filmmaker. Um, the, the, there's no question that without the women, this movement would never have been possible. And, uh, you know, we wanted to, to really give enough time for Iltazam Morar, who was, who was 15 at the time, to really talk about, like, quite what, what this extraordinary thing he was, where she, you know, you know, challenged her father, and her father gave her the opportunity. And, and one of the things that happens often in screenings that we're doing in the West Bank, because now this film is being used by communities on the ground as a tool for uh, organizations, not, not, not formal organizations, but the popular committees in each of these villages that are uh, trying to do similar things in villages like Walaje, that, that is close to Jerusalem and is about to be encircled. Uh, they are bringing in the film, they bring in Ayah and Iltisam to talk about what they did. And, and it's, it's quite extraordinary, like, the, the effect that that has on people, especially on the understanding of the need for women to participate. Because in many of the other villages that are currently still doing this every week, the women are not that active uh, anymore. And so and, and a huge part of why Buddhists worked the way it did is because the women were there. Ayad talks about something, Ayad Murad um, says that, you know, the, the first thing that women do is that just by being present, the men look around and they see their daughters and they see their sisters and their mothers and they can't curse. And just the fact that they can't curse already sets mm -hmm. the tone for everything that comes afterwards. Then the chanting becomes much more about overcoming the odds and, and it's more peaceful and it's not as aggressive towards the, the Israeli military and it's not cursing the Israeli military. And all of the things kind of create the, the atmosphere for a nonviolent movement that, that can have the discipline to stand for. And this is because of the women. And, and this is what women being there cause. Now, in terms of us, and, and Yasmin Levy was sent there because there were so many women. Because one of the challenges that, that the Israeli um, border police faced was that for the men, for the Israeli male, male border police officers to be touching and, and arresting and, and moving around the women caught, steered the community. It really made the men that go wild, right, to see the men touching their women. And so they send in women to deal were the women and women beating women um, somehow became acceptable and and so um, the the Yasmin Levy played this role like that that was her thing and you see some you know tough imagery and, and obviously you know you saw how the Palestinian women were like they believed they had this belief that no she's a woman she can understand this and they really hanged on to this like trying to bring her and of course then it became a sarcastic thing and a playful thing that, that they did as well um, we are a team, so the people from Just Vision, uh, we are uh, practically all women. So my two producers, I have an Israeli producer, Ronit Avni, and a Palestinian producer, Rula Salameh. And uh, I think that um, being a woman has helped her, us a lot. And you know, a lot of the scenes inside people's homes where you're sitting there with the family, with the women, um, I think for men, it can take a little bit longer for the women to feel comfortable being close to you by yourself. It's harder for you know an interview if you want to do just you and her. Um, being a woman is very easy. Being a man, I think you would need more time to, to be accepted. Um, and, and, that, and there's a sense of um, skepticism that this film is going to lead to anything, really. So often, you know, I think we, we got a little bit, uh, we got the advantage of, of being, oh, this is just this girls doing this film. What is going to come out of it? You know, three <laughs> girls with the camera. And, and so I think that allowed us people, you know, people felt more comfortable with us. <laughs> Thank you. So this was the result. Um, questions from the audience? Hey, you can ask anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a question. Okay, please speak up. Um, I thought it was obligated in Israel to join the army at a certain age, but the Israeli activists were not in the army. I wondered why. Did everybody hear the question? 
I'll let, the, so the, the, uh, she's saying, I thought that uh, in Israel uh, everybody was obligated to join the army, but the activists were not in the army. So how come is that? And I'll let uh, Jonathan respond. Well, um, you always have a choice. And some of the activists did do the army, actually, in their past. And actually, because of their military service, they decided to become later on activists. Uh, like Shai also was filming a lot. the military and a lot of the activists. But it's, in the end, it's a choice. I mean, we can say that you have to do it, but there are always ways to get out of it. I mean, I didn't do my military service there. So it's, yeah, it's an option. I mean, it's I, difficult. I, I will say something. Okay. He's, he's, he's placing himself as an Israeli activist here who wants to encourage people to believe that it's easy okay. and you don't need to serve. But I will say something. It's not, not, it's not easy not to serve. Like Israeli activists who take a stance and try to get away, it's possible to get it. Many, most of it through medical. Um, ex like you, you basically, a lot of people are faking, you know, medical conditions that, that don't allow them to join the army all the time. And the army wants to allow those those conditions to to excuse them because otherwise these people get counted as conscientious conscientious objectors and that the government does not want. So actually it's incredibly hard for an Israeli young person to, to, be, to get the government to recognize that they are refusing the army from moral, ethical reasons. For women, for women it's easier. For, for women it's easier, but still not, I know, the, you know, Maya like told me her story, like they're, they're you know, the, the, what they do is they keep putting you in prison and then after one year they take like there's uh, Maya Wind who was one of the you know at 19 she she was one of the start started the demonstrations in Sheikh Jarrah in East Jerusalem which are very active now and I encourage all of you to to look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about it's amazing um, and she she tried she wanted to refuse from ethic from moral from for moral reasons and the army kept putting her in prison tried to get her out they offered her you know why don't you sign this which said that you know, something about her medical condition or her mental condition, and she refused. And if you refuse to sign that, then you go to prison. And after one year in prison, then they take you out and they offer you the paper again. Now do you want to <laughs> sign it? And then you have to say no, and then you go to prison again. And some people actually go to prison for quite a few years. Most people just sign the paper and, and get away on medical conditions. Um, in the end, she ended up signing after, I think, two years that she did. Um, and so, so it's not, so yes. There are ways out, but the consequences in yes. Israeli society, you are, you are ostracized. Um, it's harder to, to get uh, jobs you know, in, in, a, in, a, in your CV. Uh, like at Just Vision, we have an office in East Jerusalem, and we hire Israelis. And the first thing in the CV is your mil what, what your service was in the military. And it's an essential part for getting jobs, for going to school, for getting to dorms. So it's, it's, a, it's a very integral part of, of becoming an adult um, in Israeli society. Absolutely, many people are getting out. But they're very courageous for doing that. It's not easy. So another question, please.